Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Vago Maradian. Our podcast is brought to you by Bell. Since 1935, Bell has been redefining flight. Learn more about its pioneering spirit at bellflight.com. Later in the program, Brian Clark on his new role at the Hudson Institute, but joining us now is Frank Kendall, former Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, who is now a consultant and a Lidos board member and affiliated with the Center for American Progress, as well as the Center for Strategic and International Studies. His article, What Washington Must Do to Protect the Real Defense Industrial Base, the Workers from Coronavirus, went up on Forbes on Sunday. He's also got a great piece on the Defense Production Act that President Trump has invoked. That is on the CAP website. Frank, thanks as always for joining us. Thanks, Vago. Good to be with you. Thoughtful commentaries uh, on both uh, venues. Let's start with the Forbes one. You note a contradiction in the the Pentagon's declaration last Friday that defense contractors constitute critical infrastructure. That means that contractors have to continue to travel, continue to work, continue to meet, even if their customers aren't there, which seems illogical on its face. Walk us through some of the concerns you've got with the approach and what DOD should be doing instead. Well, my recommendation to DOD was to let industry know uh, that it will cover costs associated with taking reasonable precautions to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. An industry has to react to something like this. It was unexpected, certainly not covered by their contracts directly. What they need to know from the government is whether or not the government will pay for any costs that they incur as a result of this. An alternative approach is to um, basically do what Ellen Lord appears to have done, which is to tell people to just work anyway and, and take whatever risk is associated with that. I don't think that's the right thing to do for our workers, and I don't think it's necessary. In most cases, uh, contractors can make accommodations and continue their work. And what I was definitely not recommending was shutting down the defense industry. That's not necessary. Uh, But at the same time, we can do things that, that mitigate the risk for our employees. At the end of the day, what is the financial implication here? Um, Because historically, the Pentagon has sort of covered these sorts of, of costs. How much cost would be associated with allowing greater telework and flexing on these on these meetings? I mean, there are some who suggest that some of this would be calamitous for defense programs and sort of delay them excessively. But all of society is teleworking at this point. Not everything is done in a secure compartmented information facility. I mean, at the end of the day, what do you eyeball the cost of this being if we decided to allow contractors to put put the health and safety of their employees ahead of a potential contractual obligation? I don't think it's dramatic. Uh, I don't think it's trivial, but I don't think it's dramatic. You know, what I've mentioned in the article was, uh, this is really just a guesstimate of hundreds of millions to maybe a few billion dollars. If you, if you think about the size of the amount of money that's spent in, in contracted work by Department of Defense, you know, it's, it's, it's three, three to four hundred billion dollars. Uh, if you take a fraction of that as the impact here, I think you'd probably be in a right ballpark, and I think a small fraction. So I don't, I don't think that the impact would be dramatic, particularly when you look at the, the amount of money that the government is throwing at the economy right now. We're talking about two trillion dollars and in, in, in growing in the amount of money the government is spending to kind of prevent economic disruption. So the delta here, I think, is a very tiny fraction of that. Let's go to the telework uh, part of the equation. Uh, that's increasingly becoming an option for everybody. That certainly is the case for us. We're not coming into contact with people to tape videos like we used to, so we're doing a daily podcast series that we can produce remotely. Federal workers, by and large, are working remotely, and the Pentagon is a ghost town now. Um, how effectively can the acquisition organization operate when operating remotely to keep programs on track? Because at the end of the day, you know, every delay could result in a significant cost increase downstream. Well, you gotta th- you got to think, first of all, about the very, very wide variety of things that are done by the defense industrial base. You've got engineers working in cubicles. Uh, you've got factory floor workers. You've got shipyard workers. You've got supply chain workers that are doing castings and forgings or circuit forage or, or whatever. So when you, when you put out very broad guidance like the department did, it, it tends to capture all of those, and they're very, very different situations, which generally, I think, need to be addressed individually, uh, particularly for exceptions where you're going to mandate that people work despite a health risk. So there are things that can be done, but they, they involve cost. Uh, 
if you go to shift work for engineers so that people can have vacant cubicles next to them. Uh, that's a possibility. It doesn't, you know, it, it does have a little bit of an impact on collaboration, but it can still be done. Uh, you can go to multiple shifts. You can find ways to re reorganize your work on a factory floor so that people aren't as in contact as they might be. Uh, don't have the daily meetings that you might have had with everybody in the room for a stand-up every morning. There are a lot of things that people can do to, to accommodate the risk associated with the coronavirus. But what they need is the charter to go do them and the knowledge that the government will cover whatever marginal increase in costs there are. Um, how do you, um, you also wrote thoughtfully about the Defense Production Act. I want to get to that. But I want to ask a little bit about the global supplier base and how the department's got to be moving to ensure that it's indemnifying itself. I mean, for example, the F-35 program uh, absorbed a significant part of your time as it did uh, defense leadership all the time. It's history's greatest program. It's the most collaborative program on the planet. And Italian manufacturers uh, have all but shut down, unfortunately, in port because of the tragedy coronavirus is, is inflicting on the Italian people. At the end of the day, how do we need to look at the supply chain and what is it the Pentagon should be doing right now to protect itself to again, avoid bigger downstream problems, especially with smaller suppliers that may be hardest hit on which the entire ecosystem may depend. Uh, that's a great point, Vago. And the, probably the, the small businesses affected by all of this, many of which are both commercial and military uh, providers, uh, are, are the ones that are most at risk. They don't have the financial clout to, to, to borrow money and stay in business uh, if, they're, if their orders dry up. So whatever relief that the Pentagon provides through the primes has got to flow down to the supply chain. And that's going to be largely a matter of, you know, direction and follow up and, 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 you know, just attention to detail and, and making a very clear communication to the, to the primes that that's what's expected of them. Whatever relief they get from, uh, from, you know, a policy like the one I suggested has got to flow down to the suppliers. They're the ones most at risk here. Um, let's talk about the Defense Production Act. The president invoked it. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion associated with what exactly the White House wanted folks to do, but industry has by and large responded uh, on its own. General Motors and Fiat Chrysler, two giant automakers, I should say that General Motors Defense is one of our sponsors, are partnering with respirator makers to increase volume and production. Pernod Ricard, uh, an adult beverage maker, has shifted to making sanitizers, as uh, the White House's Peter Navarro uh, pointed out. What's the right way to think of the national industrial complex, including the defense industrial piece of this, in addressing the, the challenge we have? And what are some lessons that we can learn now through this process that may be highly applicable in the event that we have an actual military or national security crisis in the future? Okay, well, my biggest concern with the DPA is that it's not being used. The, the DPA gives the president a lot of authority. Uh, and the, uh, President Trump has indicated that he does not want to essentially interfere in the marketplace. That's actually exactly what needs to be done in wartime. And this is essentially a wartime-like event. It's a national problem. Uh, free market is great in peacetime for basically generating productivity and efficiency and for responding to people's needs. But, but in wartime, you've got to focus on the highest priorities and get industry to do that for you. Industry can't on its own prioritize where to send its products. It's going to send them to the people who ordered first who are paying the most. That's not the way we want allocation done right now. So the DPA gives the president the authority to step in and, and adjust that and ensure that the things that are needed are, are partly being sold at reasonable prices. And there's not price gouging going on or competitive bidding between governors, which appears to be the case right now. And that the things that are needed the most get to where they're needed the most. Uh, that's what needs national direction. The first recommendation I made in that article you mentioned was we set up a command and control system to manage all this. Now, FEMA is probably in the best position to uh, work with the states. DLA, Defense Logistics Agency, is probably in the best position to do management of the actual logistics of this. Uh, but that needs to be set up. And my understanding is right now things are being run out of the situation room by you know, people doing very ad hoc uh, activities. That's not the way to run a war, uh, not one on this scope and this complexity. And that, to me, that's the biggest shortfall right now. Are there techniques and thinking we can pioneer as a course of this challenge to prepare ourselves for the future? 
Yes, and I think that's the first thing on my list. We need a, a national ability in terms of organization, technology, exercises to be prepared to deal with something like this and respond efficiently and effectively and in a timely way. And right now, we're, we're generally speaking, I think, from the national perspective at least, I'd say the state as well, in a very reactive mode. People are playing catch up. Uh, they need to be thinking ahead and have the capacity in place so that they can do that. I mean, time is our biggest enemy here. It has been from day one. And we lost a lot of time by not responding to this early. Uh, we need to learn from that and be, not have that repeat itself. Frank, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And John Bago, thanks. And now a word from our sponsor. The Defense and Aerospace Report podcast is brought to you by the Bell V-280 Valor, bringing the mission technology of the future to the battlefield of today. Visit bellflight.com for more. And joining us now is retired United States Navy Commander Brian Clark, who has uh, left the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, where he was one of the longtime naval analysts there to join the Hudson Institute, where he is now a senior fellow and will have a different capacity. Brian, congratulations on the move. Well, thank you very much, Vago, and thank you for having me on the program. And congratulations on your own, uh, the daily podcast. I think it's a great idea. Thanks very much. Uh, in, uh, we're, we're trying to keep people as informed as possible in these times of uh, plague and uh, pestilence uh, and uncertainty, going from one terrific organization to another one. Uh, obviously, uh, Ken Weinstein is looking at building up his uh, capability uh, there uh, before he goes off to Japan uh, to become America's next uh, ambassador. Talk to us a little bit about this new program and what you hope to achieve. Uh, yeah, Vago. So the, the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology, which is the name, is uh, going to focus on the implications of new technologies for how, uh, US, how militaries in general, in particular the U.S. military, is going to operate in the future, uh, the capabilities they're going to pursue, and the strategy that might emerge. So the, 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 as opposed to some of the recent um, efforts that have been done on looking at the implications of new technology, the center is going to focus on operational uh, impacts and how new technology could be used by militaries uh, for good or for ill um, as part of their, their approaches. And what are some of the specific studies uh, you guys are going to be working on, uh, you and your team are going to be working on? So we're, we're going to start off looking at um, new concepts for anti-submarine warfare that are going to be made possible by the emergence of new sensors, uh, unmanned systems, and how those uh, approaches might differ and be more uh, cost-effective than some of the current approaches, which tend to uh, use manned aircraft, manned ships that are relatively expensive and, and you know, have a high maintenance uh, over, over, overhead associated with them. Uh, another study we're going to do is on 5G, how the military could be using 5G um, for its own communications, both uh, inside the continental United States as well as overseas. Uh, we're going to do a study looking at the use of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems in warfare, which will be a follow-on to our Mosaic Warfare project we did at CSBA. And those are kind of the first three big things we're going to do out of the gate. It's been a while since the U.S. military has sort of rethought anti-submarine warfare. You and I have talked about this, that even at a time when we used to practice anti-submarine warfare a lot, you know, mutual friends from uh, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, conceded that we weren't as good as we really needed to be even back then. And now we have the added disadvantage of not having really worked on it for a very long time. What does a new vision, a new approach a new theory to anti-submarine warfare look like in this modern era? Uh, that's a great observation, Vago. So we've, um, you know, since we haven't had the threat of a pure competitor for a long time, um, the U.S. has kind of fallen into a focus on using anti-submarine warfare primarily for intelligence gathering, which means every event ends up being something we can devote a lot of resources to. There's a relatively small number of them you know, each year, each month. Uh, and they're used primarily to be able to train crews and gather intelligence for later use. That approach won't work if you're dealing with an adversary that's now um, flooding the zone with submarines uh, and using them for, for some military end. And so you don't have the luxury of, of kind of chasing them around. You've got to do something about them quickly and move on to the next threat. Uh, so we think you know, we need to move to a new anti-submarine warfare approach that's going to be scalable to that kind of future war fight. Uh, moreover, we need to do something that's going to be less expensive than our current way of doing anti-submarine warfare, which is very resource intensive 
And, um, you know, while it may be a justifiable expense for training, it's certainly not going to be something we can afford to do uh, on a large scale in a war. Do you, um, at, you know, you spent a lot of time looking at China, and obviously China and Russia are the two sort of key anti-submarine warfare pacing threats. I'm not trying to minimize the North Koreans, especially with their small submarines that have actually drawn blood in, in sinking a uh, South Korean corvette. But are you looking at all in, as how the coronavirus epidemic, a potential uh, increasing pressure on the Chinese defense budget, may actually change how dropping oil prices, right? That's not a positive development from a Russian perspective either. How some of these broader economic factors may actually change materially the ability of some of these great power adversaries we have to project very expensive submarine power around the world. It's interesting to note. So Russia um, was still able to field a capable force of submarines, even in the darkest days of the post-Cold War. But it was a very small submarine force. So they took what resources they had and devoted them to maintaining a very small number of very high-end submarines. Um, I could see the Russians continuing to pursue that, even in a, even with low oil prices that are causing huge budget deficits over in Russia, based on at least what appears to be the break-even uh, budget in terms of oil prices. So I would expect them to continue to field and deploy uh, their current submarine fleet, which is very capable. It's just very small. And so as a result, their strategy is focused on using those submarines, mostly in a very niche set of missions that would help them in a potential conflict with the U.S. So I would imagine the Russians are likely to use their attack submarines to threaten U.S. SSBNs down by Kings Bay, Georgia. Um, and they're, they could also use them to threaten attacks against the U.S. East Coast um, because you know, it's, it's hard. we don't have like an air defense network that's going to protect us from that kind of threat. So the, the Russians have a very niche set of missions they can use that small submarine force for. The Chinese have less of a, a, an easy you know, mission set like that for their submarine force. Um, so I think what's going to happen is they would probably begin to retire some of their older submarines that probably are past their useful service life anyway, and keep their remaining resources devoted to the most modern uh, Yuan, um, and uh, maybe some of the Song class uh, AIP diesel submarines. And talk to us about how you're going to continue uh, to partner with uh, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments where you spent so many successful years. Uh, so I'm going to continue to be a non-resident senior fellow at CSBA. And um, for example, this uh, 5G project that we've got coming up um, is going to be a collaborative effort with CSBA. And in addition to that, um, this mosaic warfare work that we're going to do um, uh, on behalf of DARPA will also be a collaboration with CSBA. So we can, we're going to continue to maintain that relationship with CSBA going forward uh, because there's a great pool of talent there and they obviously do fantastic work. Um, there'll be ways that we can work together going forward. Um, this center, though, I see as a way to really kind of focus on technology in a way that uh, maybe I wasn't able to do as much at CSBA. That's terrific. Fairwinds following seas, uh, Brian, and looking forward to staying in touch and reporting on your coming great works. Thank you very much, Vago. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Please follow our daily podcasts with top government, military, industry, and thought leaders at Defense and Aerospace Report and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Follow us on Twitter at Def Aero Report. That's at D-E-F-A-E-R-O Report. Like us on Facebook at Defense and Aerospace Report and check us out on LinkedIn. Check out our weekly cyber report sponsored by Northrop Grumman and our weekly technology report sponsored by General Motors Defense. Since 1935, Bell has been redefining flight. Learn more about its pioneering spirit at bellflight.com. Thanks again to Bell for their generous sponsorship and we'll see you again tomorrow.